Good afternoon, everyone. Long title, which Rajesh was referring to, reads, Unlocking Foundation Model Ops, Large Language Model Ops Using Apache Airflow. Trust me, I've practiced this 10 times before trying to say that in one breath without missing a beat there, okay? So learning for you, don't ever pick this long title, okay? So, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about FM Ops, which is easier to say, LLM Ops, which is also really easier to say, okay? And we'll expand once as well. And um, quick shout out there, although I am from AWS, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to not mention any AWS services. This is an Airflow Summit and not our AWS reInvent Summit where we talk only about AWS services. So for the sake of this, the approaches, techniques, best practices, et cetera, that I describe about, you can implement that in any environments, be it large language models running on your own local machines. Yes, you can do that too. Um, be it on the cloud, on-premises, data centers, or even in your wife's phones maybe, as Apple announced yesterday, okay, with the Apple intelligence. Cool. So let's talk about a uh, quick introduction to me. I am Parna Basak. I'm a senior solutions architect working for the public sector. I primarily take care of government technology customers and enable them on AWS. As in my side job, I help also evangelize our AWS service or for Apache managed service for Apache Airflow. And I have had the luckiest or the fortunate ones to go take many of our generative AI solutions for our customers to production, okay? And FYI, that does not include any chatbots, okay? Of course, there are a few chatbots uh, in that pipeline there, okay? So let me quickly raise a hand there, okay? How many of you are today experimenting with generative AI? Raise your hands if you are. Okay, that's a whole of the room, that's fantastic. How many of you are using Apache Airflow for taking those? That's great. Probably my follow-up question is, why aren't you using Apache Airflow? Okay, which we'll talk about. And today, throughout the most of the sessions and talks, I will try to showcase how you can take Apache Airflow as your orchestrator and use them to productionize large language models or use cases surrounding large language models or foundation models to production, okay? So we have a packed agenda, okay? Unfortunately, within the 20 minutes time frame, I don't have time to do demos. So if you are interested in demos on any of the use cases I talk, patterns, best practices, et cetera, look me up either mostly in the uh, dining room or in the AWS booth, which I will be always supporting with Rajesh and the team there to talk about generative AI, airflow use cases, and talking about deploying, deploying to productions. So, Let's talk quickly about machine learning. Okay, any data scientists out here? Okay, I still see two. That's a red warning, they know a lot, okay. But again, uh, data scientists are a premium today, okay. So it would be not be fair to not talk about machine learning ops or ML ops, okay, uh, which uh, data scientist friends of ours are currently using. And if you look at machine learning ops, the way we define in AWS is, is a combination of people, process, and technology that can scalably take uh, machine learning models to productions at scale. It's a combination of data science, uh, data science, DevOps, machine learning, and business operations. And what you are doing at the end of this is probably these five categories. You are reducing, increasing the productivity, agility, by creating reproducible uh, builds and deployments, and taking them to production. You are reliably doing this at scale over multiple number of iterations. You are, are doing this with auditability and observability. But at the end of it, the most important factor in there is you are lowering your total cost of ownership of maintaining and deploying this, okay? Dollar, besides use cases, top of every CTO, CIO, and CEO's mind, okay? And I'm guessing your companies or the clients you're working for are no different there. But we all know this, right? So if you ask me what are the biggest features of doing this at scale is, we talk about four categories, the people, process, and technology. We have to deal with platform administrators who are providing the infrastructure, you have to deal with data at scale, providing data to uh, all of these uh, users in a secluded way. We have to talk about experimentation, model build, model test, and model de uh, deployment. That is prime thing of MLOps. And finally, you have to do this with ML governance, auditability, traceability, et cetera, okay? 
This is where you need an orchestrator, and Apache Airflow perfectly fits the whole bill, that it can do all of these individually through a pipeline and a repeatable, scalable scale using an open source product, which is Apache Airflow. Now, when you're talking about the orchestrator, you might be asking, okay, but tell me, what are the features of Apache Airflow that can do this? And this is my kind of curated Pernub's list for the time being. So you can look at macros and Jinja templating, advanced data sets, dynamic task mapping, task flow APIs, FYI, task flow APIs are different than task, group, task groups as well. You can look at experimental lineage support, provider packages that every of the providers, uh, connectors have. You can look at backfills and reruns, automatic retries, when, whenever, whenever your ML models are not able to fetch data the first time, you can group at grouping tasks through task groups. You can look at own your own custom plugins that you can go install. And if you have not seen this, uh, you should look at setup and tear down when you can set up a totally brand new environment for a single iteration and run of Apache Airflow and then, and then uh, destroy them after your testing, evaluation, deployment, or production is done. Last but not the least, I would like to talk about dynamic compute because generative AI, unless you know this, also requires GPU compute too for some of the tasks. We'll talk about that. So with Airflow, you can run this on any kind of computes, offload the task to any kind of computes, and be able to write the DADs, which are Python, which machine learning, machine learning engineers, data scientists, Data engineers love to write them out okay, in Python using Jupyter Notebooks, which I think is a still the popular choice for machine learning engineers. Of course, monitoring and alerting is always there. And we will see how all of these features are also applicable when you take it to uh, generative AI. Okay. So with that, let's introduce generative AI. Okay. So I think the whole room knows what generative AI is. So we'll skip this slide and say, okay, everybody knows about deep learning. Okay. Here, there is generative AI, which uses a specialized form of internet at level data with neural networks, to, and they call it as generative AI because it generates something. Okay? Good, bad, or ugly, we all know what, what it generates, but it generates something. And then you have two sets of definitions. One we call as a foundation model, the other one we call as a large language model. Now, foundational models are models which are, can do a lot of general purpose tasks. Example being GPT. You can throw it a text, an image, a soundtrack, it can do a lot of things. And it can also output the same into multiple different languages too. While large language models work on data sets and can do very specific sets of tasks and can iterate over it. For example, uh, let's take an example of the stability AI stable diffusion models, which you can send a text and get images and they are trained for it. Some of our R models too, like Amazon Titan, also are text-to-text -text models in which you throw it at text and you come back with a response. So with that being said, this is, I think, a biggest differentiator between large language models and foundation models in the sense that the middle part, all of them are created through using unlabeled data sets, trained and created. But large language models like text generation, summarization, uh, information extraction, Q&A, there are specialist models that each of the providers have created to surface this, and that's why we call them as large language models. Again, in the today's world with multimodal models, this has become interchangeably true, where everybody we see, everything seems to be large language models now. Okay. Moving on, um, if you look at the personas that are using large language models, we call them or segregate them into three separate verticals or use cases. The first on the left hand side are the providers; those are there creating the large language models, the foundation models on their own using a large set of data and then leveling and creating those models of their own. They have deep machine learning expertise and they have a data science background too. And on the right hand, on, sorry, on my left hand side, your right hand side uh, are uh, the consumers who are lame, dumb users like us, who what are they are doing is essentially taking that large language model either running on local or on any other premises, and then consuming this using prompt engineering and prompt, prompt templating. Okay? And in the middle, there are fine tuners, which have upgraded from either of these sources, either from providers to fine tuners or consumers to fine tuners, where they understand that their own capability of a large language model or foundation model may not be good enough, and hence, they want to retrain that data 
not all of the weights, but some part of the weights on their own data sets to make their own, okay? So I've had a chance with a customer that worked to fine tune this, and what they did was to take their own data sets and use it to retrain that model uh, to make very specific answers. So the accuracy and precision that they were getting out of these fine-tuned models was vastly improved than what the large language model can do uh, of its own. And if, my, if you might find this very difficult, it's not. We will talk about how you can do this with Apache FLA as we go. So all of these, uh, this fine-tuners and providers still need ML ops, okay, or FM ops to go deploy this, okay. But the block on the right-hand side, the consumers, they only need pure DevOps because they are taking their own large language model and then uh, taking the base large language model and just interfacing with it using their apps, backends, et cetera. So having said that, let's deep dive into each of this. First, the consumers, the largest bulk of people like me who have no idea what machine learning and uh, data science is, but they want to create and help out customers create their uh, own specialized generative AI use cases. To that, what I'm doing is selecting a foundation model, selecting the prompt, using it as a black box, and then providing some inputs to it, getting the outputs, refining those outputs, okay, in a multiple phase, and then finally when I'm satisfied with the output, then I'm releasing that as a product or a solution, right? So this is the usual, probably 70, 80%, like we can talk about the cycle of consumers and who are the biggest users of generative AI there. So if you break this down in tasks, okay, so first and foremost, they are creating the backends, okay? And this backend are generative AI developers that they call themselves in, okay? Or I, I call them prompt engineers because they are multi practicing multiple prompts. They know how to write prompts. They know what prompt best practices are. They can understand prompts of what makes sense. And trust me, this comes by experience. The more prompts you write, the better you get and the better your solution gets. So their task being selecting an FM foundation model or large language model, doing some prompt engineering, testing the prompts over and over again, getting some inputs and outputs, and then maybe they also have a requirement to chain prompts. A output of one prompt gets into as an input of the other second prompt. They're also doing some filtering of the data that they get back, okay, and then creating a rating mechanism to understand which prompt is good, bad, or ugly. Once that is done, they give it back to the generative AI developers, wherein these are responsible for creating the app, which the backend interface, and they are simply integrating that through APIs with all the goodness of APIs, and then allowing, their, allowing a system to capture the inputs and outputs for the users. Maybe a simple rating mechanism, thumbs up, thumbs down, a rating mechanism of one to five, uh, where five being the best. And once they have done, they are releasing that to a generative AI uh, end users who are actually interacting with it, getting the understanding of all these things. Then you might be asking that what's so special about this? The special about this is the iteration that needs to happen. This has to be done at a repeated scale across multiple different iterations till you get the precision, accuracy, et cetera, right. So selecting a prompt or a generative AI model is not very easy. If you are selecting a foundation model, and probably there are thousands of foundation models and large language models out there, if you look at Huggins face every day, probably there's a foundation model being released or a fine-tuned version or iteration of it being released. There are three things that we talk about customers to, to decide. Speed, precision, and cost. Okay, with the priority being on cost. What, is, what does makes, the, uh, makes your job done in the least amount of way? Then for prompts and, prompts, and, um, prompts and large language models, you're also looking at accuracy, okay? 10 requests, this is the output, does being the non-deterministic nature of generative AI, how many, how many of them are accurate? Robustness, how vari variety am I doing? Toxicity, okay, what is uh, the difference in toxicity of it? And then some human evaluation as well. To talk through this, let's talk about how we can do this using generative AI, okay? So this is a typical pipeline that you can look at where you are taking a prompt, retrieving a prompt data sets, doing some prompt engineering, interfacing with multiple different LLMs uh, to get an understanding of what are the outputs of it, refining, ranking them, and rerunning this at scale at a number of, a number of uh, iterations. So this is where prompt evaluation, prompt engineering can be done, okay, using Airflow as an example. Then 
Of course, use, uh, use an additional compute to offload that data so that you are not running this on the Airflow workers per se. The next example is uh, the offline batch inferences, wherein probably you are, not everything is online, not everything is a chatbot. So you might be requiring some uh, interactions that I have some already large corpus of data, I have identified my prompt, I have identified my large language model, now I want to go do this at scale for my past data sets. So this is a typical example where you can, use to you, you can look forward to use Airflow to take the data sets, run it through a number of large language models, and even integrate the data. For example, let's say on a text data you want to do summarization, entity extraction, and lastly, um, some additional activities that you might find, and then integrate the data into one single corpus of data and then store it. So this can be a typical example that you can also do with an Airflow. Again, look, hook me up for any demos that you might require on it. Again, you can do this in a compute as well. The third example is retrieval augmented generation, where you are using generative AI, where you are searching the text first, Okay, uh, for applicable question answers, and then taking the answers over to a large language model to generalize and retrieve. So in case of retrieval augmented generation, extracting and ingesting data is of uh, primary use. And again, you can use Apache Airflow through a sample pipeline like this, where you're extracting, transforming some data that you already have, then you're using an embeddings model with generate embeddings, and then storing them in a vector store, okay? Again, this is generic enough to say that you can use any vector store on-prem, on the cloud, et cetera, but you do need a vector store to store all your embeddings in. Again, this can be also be done using offloading computer and external CPU instances. And the last example is about fine tuners who are taking the data, taking the data, labeling it, doing a deployment after creating uh, some fine tuning processes and repeating this at scale uh, multiple number of times. So for doing generative AI fine tuning, you will take that same idea, but in this case, you would see that the front end developers are creating multi-tenancy, meaning creating multiple variations of this for the end users, and they are using something called a fine tuner or adapter, which we're we'll going to talk about next. So that is uh, what they are doing. To just give an example of a fine tuning process, and we talk about, take an example of uh, the parameter efficient fine tuning, where you're training some of the parameters out of the large million, billion dollar, million, uh, not dollar, million number of parameters that is already trained on. You're taking a custom data set, again, you're preparing some data, and then you are taking the pre-trained foundation model, large language model, you're downloading a LoRa adapter from PyPy, and then you're going through this process where you are downloading the weights, freezing some of the weights, adding the new weights from our database, and then computing a low rank uh, weight matrix out of this, and then doing some checkpoint and calculations, and then doing some quantization, which is normalizing the large language models to be deployable and quick and fast, and finally deploying this, again, doing this in a number of epochs. Not as big as what the large language models by itself was trained on, but again, this is a typical pipeline where you can use Apache Airflow to do parameter efficient fine tuning using a LoRa or QLoRa techniques, okay? Um, lastly, the providers. These are uh, creating, uh, creating the large language models upfront, and trust me, you can create your large language model too. It's not that hard, okay? It's just to need some weeks and months of training and some GPU instances, okay? If you have access to any of those, feel free to, okay? Or if not, um, use your process credit card bill to sign into a cloud provider and use the GPU instances there. Okay, anyways, coming back, so if you have looked at the transformer architecture made popular by attention is all you need white paper, this is what creating a large language model from scratch looks like. There's multiple layers, you are training this into multiple epochs, and each of the nodes or epochs are utilizing an encoder-decoder-based architecture to go do that. Again, we have an AWS blog that talks about all of this in detail. Okay, if you are interested, uh, ask me out on those. Okay, so now that we understood the differences between machine learning ops and um, generative AI, uh, or machine learning ops and foundation model LLM ops, let's quickly understand the differentiators, okay? So this is typically the pipeline that calls it out. On the top, I show you the conventional ML paradigm. We are creating smaller data sets and then creating a machine learning model out of it. But the generative AI paradigm 
talks about the model providers who are taking internet scale data, which is massive, massive amounts of data, pre-processing, building the foundation models, and then there are tuners who are taking that foundation model and fine tuning it. That's a different set of machine learning expertise than uh, what the machine learning experts on the top can do. Finally, you have still the consumers who are uh, just uh, using it as a black box, either the fine tuned model or the foundation model itself. So remind, let me quickly remind you of the people process architecture there, okay? So here you have fine tuners that are now into the fold. Please include fine tuners as a part of your machine learning MLOps lifecycle. You also have the data engineers who are leveling that data if you're doing fine tuning there. And you also have the application developers who needs to give back the data uh, to understand if, the, if your model needs to be retrained. Finally, uh, you are, have a niche set of users where we are using uh, generative AI for those users as well. Of course, orchestration can be done using Apache Airflow as well. Okay, so that's what it looks like. There is a barcode up there. Uh, look it up if you have time after this session to understand more about each of the phases, what are the tasks involved, and how Airflow can do this. Okay, so people, process, and technology. Okay, so we talked about this, and I think this is the most important slide as to how to call out MLOps, um, FMOps, and LLMOps. There is an overlap, but there are new techniques and, uh, and techniques and processes that are introduced by including uh, for LLMs and FMOps too. That includes those uh, 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 parameter efficient fine fine tuning, parameter uh, uh, summarization, etc. Okay. Um, so if I just summarize this, this is probably a few of the differentiators there. You have, uh, you bring in a specialty set of, uh, specialty set of processes and peoples that includes the providers, fine tuners, and as well as consumers who are different because now consumers have to do prompt engineering. In previous machine learning model lifecycle, they just did an API call and got back the results. In case of selecting the FM, there are specific tasks because now you have, since there are so many of them, you have to be very diligent as to what you consider, how you pick your uh, foundation model or LLM, and then go use and adopt it in your code. And finally, there's an evaluation completely changes, okay, uh, versus machine learning in the sense that you have to worry about toxicity, you have to worry about tone, you have to worry about assertiveness. There are multiple different parameters that uh, LLM ops also bring, brings in. And of course, the technology piece, we all know that uh, all of these are now required GPU, which previously the machine learning did not require any. Okay, so talking about uh, Airflow, whatever you are doing, MLOps, FMOps, LLMOps, okay? If there is one thing that I want you to take forward from this slide is this, that workflow as code using Apache Airflow can do all of this, okay, at consistent scale with the least TCO. You have, it is dynamic, it's extensible, it is also flexible, you can do your own plugins. It is data and compute agnostic. You can run it even on your local machines, on the cloud, on premises, data centers, etc. It is scalable, you can have, you can create a large language model right out of it using Air Airflow as well. It is a rich, rich ecosystem of providers to be able to connect to any data sources, data warehouses, databases, et cetera. Lastly, it is community driven, so your voice matters. Please, if you have, if you see a feature that Airflow is missing, let us know, and the community is vibrant through the Slack channel that they can address those. Lastly, continuous innovation. We're gonna hear about Airflow 3.0 as we go along, but there are more innovations that we can go drive, and that's where Airflow as an open source orchestrator tool, which supplies, which provides you with Python code in a native way, which is directly integrates with MLOps, FMOps, or LLMOps, is super useful. With that being said, I will leave you some resources. 